to be Irish was to be certain that things were going Ireland's way at last and certain that there wasn't a hope in hell with Ireland's luck. To be Irish was to be resentful, flippant, European, nationalistic, demented, the island of saints and scholars and not a saint left among them. People writing books and shooting films and doing pop-up gigs in town squares. People recording themselves, performing poetry on the Atlantic shore, sneering out at Canada. What could you do except keep trying to tell the story of it? To be young and gifted and damp. <laughs> well, you just heard from an author who has certainly succeeded in telling the story of it, Lisa McInerney, reading from The Rules of Revelation, the final part of a trilogy that's won awards for its incisive comic take on drug dealers, sex workers, property developers, and of course, artists. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now that preface that you read, that passage you read, sorry, is prefaced with the phrase, it was a funny time to be Irish. Is it still a funny time to be Irish and why? It is always a funny time to be Irish. There's, there's something about Ireland is where we, we change our identity and we change where we are and our standing and how we feel about it constantly. There is a constant state of change in Ireland. And even in the last, we'll say, 10 years, we've had two huge referenda that kind of changed the course of Irish history. We've gone from being a very kind of religious nation to a very secular nation. We're just, you know, constantly on the cusp of some big change happening. So I think the joke in that line is that it's always a funny time to be Irish. And that's probably why we like to write about it so much. Mm, yeah. Indeed. Now, uh, you mentioned religion. Uh, the book's just been translated into French as Les Lois de la Révélation. In English, its title sounds biblical, the book of Revelation. But there's mm. another sort of revelation at the heart of this book, revealing something about yourself. And you have characters, musicians who have this rule Art and honesty are inseparable. Do you hold yourself to the same standard? What do you reveal about yourself in this novel? Oh, I think that's really interesting because the idea in the novel is that it feels, even as a statement, it feels quite lofty and it feels kind of like something that, that, that can't really be achieved in that sense. I'm not too sure. I think I, I, I wanted to write... So my previous two books, they were quite downbeat and they were, they were kind of acerbic and they were really taking on... Um, you know, the Ireland and the myth of Ireland and how we felt about ourselves. And I think in this one, what I've probably revealed is the idea that it would be nice to end on something hopeful and to go forward. So this is probably the softer uh, of the three books. And maybe maybe I'm getting soft. Maybe mm. this is the thing. Reveal your optimistic side, in fact. Yeah. And that trilogy <laughs> uh, it starts in Cork, comes back there too in this final part. But one of your main characters, Ryan Cusack, has just come back from Korea. He's also lived in Italy. You write about his experiences there. How do you immerse yourself in those other worlds? Do you go there and get a taste for the expat life as part of your research? Oh, God, I would love <laughs> to have gone. No, but like this is the great thing about writing, I guess, in the 21st century is that the accessibility of other of other cultures and of other nations is, is so much more than it was. I, I would imagine for writers who were writing a few years back, it's a case that we can we can have access to people from other cultures and chat with them and we can go on Street View and Google Maps and like read all of these things. So no, I would I would love to have said, yes, I spent a year in Korea, I spent a year in Berlin, I spent a year in Naples. No, unfortunately, no. The whole thing was written from Ireland. <laughs> wow, but with some incredibly granular research then. Oh, thank you. And there are some really interesting parent-child dynamics mm. in this book and the previous ones. You write really well about generation gaps. How would you characterise the younger generation now, this new Ireland and its youth? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. So I think that the fact that we have come of age in this Ireland that keeps changing, in this Ireland that keeps uh, redefining itself, I think has led to the younger, the newer Irish generation being a lot more outward looking, but also in the sense that previous generations may have emigrated and left Ireland behind, this generation is kind of outward looking, but seeking to bring kind of the best of the world back with them. So there is a kind of sense of, I suppose, angry hope is the idea, because there is, there is a dissatisfaction with the various crises in Ireland, like the housing crisis, which I know we're experiencing all over Europe, the housing crisis particularly being a moment that we're, they're, we're railing against. But the sense of, I guess, hope for Ireland and belief in what it could be, I think is, is, is something that characterises 
this generation. Mm, also a certain sense of optimism there. But speaking of the uh, older generations and a mm. um, more old-fashioned perhaps idea we have of Ireland, there's also mention in this book of the Magdalene Laundries, mm. uh, the institutions that single mothers were sent to uh, for forced labour until very yep. recently, the 1990s, in Ireland. One character in your book refers to them as our great shame. How much of a shadow do you think that the, these institutions cast on contemporary Ireland? Is it still a part of the nation's psyche? 100% it's still part of the nation's psyche, absolutely. It's it's an interesting one because the rejection of that kind of very religious, very conservative Ireland is is kind of what marks the newer generation apart um, from older generations. And it, it's, it's kind of what defines us. Despite the fact that this is history, it's still history that we are we are dealing with and it feels very raw and there's still discoveries being made, um, horrific discoveries that we then have to deal with on a, on a national level. So it's an interesting thing. It's not something that can be safely confined to the past. It's something that's still developing. It's something that still defines who we are, something that we're still grappling with. So, yeah. Mm. And the rules of revelation, uh, coming back to perhaps something a bit more personal for you, makes some interesting points about the work of making art, the business of mm. being creative, making a living from it. That can be a bit of a battle for various reasons. You wrote a, a tongue-in-cheek guide on uh, escaping the working class for the <laughs> anthology Common People. Do you think the working class experience experience is overlooked in contemporary literature or in the arts in general? I think in the arts in general, absolutely it is. Um, and I think that it's, it's possibly a growing problem in that accessibility to the business of making art is, is, is kind of becoming, I suppose, I suppose most, more strained um, for working class people, especially as it becomes something that you go to college for, mm. that you get a degree in. Um, and then, you know, you're, people from my background, which is Council Estate Ireland, which is, you know, that, that kind of social housing Ireland or whatever, feel more distanced from it. I do think that we are lucky in Ireland to have a lot of working class artists working and kind of visible and particularly in writing. But I do think that, like, in general, it is a, a bigger problem you know, outside of nationality around the world, how do we keep providing that route into making art? Because if you're shutting out one part of society, then you're only hearing a certain amount of stories and voices and representation is very important too. Mm -hmm. So, Well, one attempt to grapple with that question, I heard about a, a pilot project from the Irish government to give a group of artists a universal basic income for a few years. Do you think that could really change the arts in Ireland or save them? I, I would hope so. So... Uh, the great thing about um, the Irish state at the moment is the, the value that it puts in the arts and the support that it gives to artists. So this is just one pilot scheme, but we also have funding available, for example, to writers from the Arts Council for bursaries, various grants, various supports. So this is just another, I suppose, improvement in that and, and, and hope for that to go forward. I think it is, considering Ireland is a small country that relies very heavily on, on the concept of the arts and culture to promote us around the world and to kind of like be part of our national identity, yes, we need to look after our artists. And I think something like this can really make a difference and kind of provide that way in for people who would otherwise have been shut out. Mm. Now, you mentioned uh, earlier just this desire to write about what it is to be Irish today. Uh, we discuss, it's discussed in the book. And one thing that seems to be emerging as part of this national identity is the Irish language. More film and television mm. being made in Gaelic. Actor Paul Mescal was, uh, yeah. went viral on the red carpet for speaking Gaelic at the BAFTAs. Uh, Killian Murphy even thanked the Academy when he won an Oscar Good. in Gaelic. Do you think this is a momentary trend or it's a, a real significant shift away from English as a default? I think that we are still some years away from moving away from English as a default. And we have our own dialect of English, which we speak uh, very uh, beautifully, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but no, I think, I, I think it's a moment that's going to grow and I think it's a concept that's going to grow. I think the connection to the Irish language is, is, is finally coalescing again after many years of it being seen as a, a, you know, a peasant language or not a useful language, um, particularly for a country that's marked by immigration, you know, or leaning into English was very important to us. And I think there's, there's more Gwail schools, which is where children are educated primarily through the Irish language. Just more of a sense of pride about Irish identity and our, our, our particular culture that I think is going to grow and grow. But I, I think that um, we're not going to be turning away from English anytime soon. OK, well, for anyone who does want to <laughs> delve into that history and learn more about Gaelic, its roots and its contemporary use, the Irish Cultural Centre here in Paris has an online exhibition. So that's accessible to anyone anywhere and that's on their website you can check it out now you've just wrapped up a trilogy of novels so in literary terms 
what's next for you? Are you looking for a different writing experience? Yeah, I'm going to do something different next time. I've got a lot on at the moment. Um, I'm an editor as well and I write screenplays. So like I'm, I'm desperately trying to get back to writing a novel, but it will be something I think quite different. I think it'll be it'll be exploring new things, new challenge as a writer to try and do something different. So, yeah, mm, we look forward to, to hearing about it now. Eventually. Finally, <laughs> in a while. Finally, we asked you what's on your cultural radar. You pointed us in the direction of music, an album from an Irish singer, Rachel Abel. It's called Big Dreams. Mm. What is it about Rachel's music that appealed to you? Oh, it's just, she's just got the most magnificent voice. I think I described it. She's like a siren from Greek mythology. There's just something so unusual and powerful and dreamy about it. I, I've been listening to this album, Big Dreams, a lot while I'm writing. So it's it's really quite something. It's something fresh. It's something contemporary. And she writes about contemporary experiences and she writes about, you know, she sings about anxiety and, mm. and kind of urban um, life and all of these things in the most kind of timeless way. I think she's wonderful. OK, well, thank you very much for thank the you. tip. Thank you for coming in today, Lisa. We'll leave you with some of Rachel LaBelle's music. This track is called Travel Size from the album Big Dreams. A reminder that the Rules of Revelation is now out in English and in French. Do join us here next time on Arts24. Until then, there's more news coming up just after this. Say so you know what a mystery. I'm slipping, living, travel size. Tight squeeze, cool breeze, now you got the ice by. With my little eye Something beginning with dance 